All right, before I go into this live deal, I want to thank everybody for the uh, kind words on social media mm -hmm. and uh, all the feedback we've been getting on the podcast uh, helps me keep it free. Um, keep those coming in, keeps my rankings up nice and high and uh, allows me to bring you this information. So uh, today we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be talking about elk hunting and I gathered a few guys that know one or two things about elk hunting and uh, we put out a couple posts yesterday to gather some questions. So I've got a big bank of questions, but if you guys got some other questions uh, that you want to shoot to us live, we're going to do our best to answer them. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're going to roll into this. Welcome to the interviews with the Hunting Masters podcast. I'm your host, John Stallone, and this week we're going uh, live talking elk. I got uh, Mario Gristo with us, and we have uh, Matt Woodward and Shannon Mobs and uh, Corey Ford. We're going we're gonna to take questions live here, and we're going to do our best to, uh, to get to everybody. So how's everybody doing today, guys? Doing good, John. Awesome. Great, John. Oh, Jesus, that was loud. Um, Look I'm at going the horn to... horn there. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, I'm... yeah. Was that, was that me? Oh, no. all the antler you have, antler porn. Oh, oh antler porn, yeah. 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 <laughs> Hold it back there. Yeah. You guys really don't want to look at me, do you? No, no, no like definitely. Give it there. Just put your head to one side. Put your head to one side. We'll look at the yeah. antler porn. Yeah, tails. There you go. <laughs> nice. Um, well, let's just real quick, um, a real quick bio, like a real quick one-liner bio on all you guys, uh, starting with Shannon and uh, Corey and then Matt and Mario. Yeah, I'm Shannon Mobs. Um, uh, Angry Spike Productions. We we target uh, mature roosevelts on the Oregon and Washington coast. You're coming in really broken up. Oh, I am. Yeah, really bad, actually. You were good before. I don't know what happened. Uh, we'll let you figure that out and we'll go to Corey. Um, Corey Ford. Oh, oh. I guess we've got Mario on. I'm Corey Ford, uh, Angry Spike Productions, um, a social media event coordinator, um, Roosevelt Elk Semi Pro, and uh, um, all around Northwest Hunter. Same thing with Shannon. We target mature Roosevelt bulls on the Oregon and Washington coast, uh, blacktail when we're not hunting that, and mule deer in the late season. Matty Matt. Hey, I'm Matt Woodward. I'm from Central Arizona. Uh, I own and operate Borderland Adventures. I'm a full-time outfitter. Uh, hunt mostly in the desert southwest and in Sonora, Mexico. And last but not least, Mario Guisto. I'm Mario Guisto from Hood River, Oregon. Uh, I work for Borderland Adventures as well in the fall. Guided in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, Coos in Mexico. And uh, you'll find me in my September's now, not guiding as much, but hunting Eastern Oregon. And uh, I run a cherry farm in the summertime. So glad to be cool. here with you guys. Awesome sauce. All right, guys. Well, I'm gonna just gonna roll into this. Like I said, I got a bunch of questions yesterday um, to start off with. And I think I'm gonna start with Shannon just cause um, I know you and I have spoken about this before. Um, one of the questions was how often do you cow call versus bugling? Well, since we're targeting the mature herd bulls, I, I don't cow call very often at all. I use it every now and then to complement my bugle, uh, but for the most part, it's it's challenging those herd bulls and bugling is pretty much all I do. Awesome. Matt, you wanna th throw your uh, two cents into that? Yeah, I'd let Mario jump all over that actually, but uh, um, I'd be more prone to you know, utilize a bugle a lot more than a cow call and use a <coughs> pretty sporadically when you're especially working a big bull, especially a big bull. And Mario, what do you do? Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it just, I guess it'd be more about a lot of just a lot of factors like where you're hunting, uh, time in the rut, you know, are you hunting Oregon where you get to hunt for four weeks? Um, and then every bull's different. So, uh, I, I'm a, I love the challenge as well. I, I like Shannon, um, but there are times where I, I will use cow call calls, maybe, maybe super early 
um, if it's the right situation. There's not many cows, uh, but um, it's definitely situational. I'd, um, what I'd say, to, I, I like all the viewers to know is that listen to everybody here and then take all that and try to diverse and always be adjusting to your, your game, come, especially if you're hunting a spot for a couple of weeks. Right. You know, just try to listen to everybody and it, and um, it just, you know, always be ready to change your game. Yeah, I think the yeah. guys that do the best are the guys that are able to digest the information that they learn and be able to apply it when they see the situation is right. Like my suggestion is I don't, me personally, I don't like to call at all. Almost, I I, I kind of treat elk as deer, and I think that's why I've been more successful in late season than I have <laughs> during during the uh, you know during the rut. Uh, that and I've drew more tags during late season than I have during the rut too. But um, it's for me, I, I think um, I, I, my approach is less is less is better. But I'm not a very good I, elk I, caller. I, you know, I, I don't hunt uh, Roosevelt's at all, so. Um, I mean, I've been to the coast a few times, but um, always Rocky Mountain for me. And also, don't think that you have to cow call or bugle. Um, uh, in a lot of situations, actually, just rubbing a tree uh, will bring in a mature bull um, the right time of year. So always just change your game. Sweet. Well, I'm going to move on to the next question here. Uh, unless, uh, Corey, you want to jump uh, jump in because I don't think we're the only no, person we didn't talk to. I, yeah, no, I think everybody covered it. I mean, in our experience, what we get on the on the coast is that those big bulls, they come to big bugles and the, the some of the smaller bulls, we've called in more small bulls using cow calls and cow trying calls. to diversify our calls a little bit. But like these guys are saying, just be very universal and adapt. If, you know, if one, if one day bugling's not working, try something else because it's, it's not, there's not just one formula that will work. Awesome. Um, so my next, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to throw this in the lap of either Matt or Mario, whoever wants to take it. Best tactic for hunting elk in December with a bow in New Mexico, just because you guys guide out there. So I figure uh, you know better than us. I've, I've only been elk hunting once in New Mexico, and I only hunted for three days. So, <laughs> well, well, Matt needs to take that because he's patient. <laughs> uh, December is not my game as much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maddie, you there? We lost you. Yeah, and I don't do any late season. I don't do any late season stuff in New Mexico either. So um, I would treat that like I do some late season Arizona stuff on a pretty pretty regular basis, and uh, I think I would treat that just like any late season elk hunt, um, and treat it more like a deer, and actually uh, look for units that are glassable, look for country that's glassable in your unit, um, and actually you know do some whether it be water sitting or mostly spot and stock type scenarios it's going to be a totally different situation than in september so um, most of our elk hunting is done in the early season but we do a few hunts each year in the late season and they're typically spot and stock hunts um, or if weather conditions are right then we're sitting water in that type in the, in the desert southwest anyway right and yeah. if you have time if you're scouting i mean a lot of those bulls are going to be back to where they were picked up on your salt in the first place um in december so it's not always a bad yeah, place to try and sit water around that area yeah. if you're going to target a certain bowl or makes sense it's a lot of what i do in the late season too i just treat them like deer um and and the, and the states that you can use radios and employ radios and spotters and um i feel like that's that's always been the best for me um I get this question a lot, and I know what my opinion is on it. I'm going to ask all four of you guys what your opinion on it is. Uh, what's your opinion on frontal shots? Go ahead, Shannon. I know what yours is already because you shot yeah, yeah. <laughs> film hunting through frontal <laughs> shots. But... Quite often, actually. You know, I had to, hunting here on the thick coastal uh, rainforest, I had to adapt to the shots they give me. Right. So I, I figured out if I can shoot them quartering to me in front of the shoulder and, and on the uh, – and the back side of the brisket there, that's just like quartering away. So um, that, that shot, shot for me is, it's pretty close to 100%. Um, so I will take that under 20 yards every, every opportunity I can get. Mm -hmm. And there's great video of us doing that. So there's, there's a couple different videos. I think we're gonna release one or already have that uh, shows that exact shot very very clearly matter of fact i think i watched one yesterday morning 
Yeah, it was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday morning on YouTube that you guys had a you shooting a bull in frontal shot. That was that was pretty cool. Um, so I'm just gonna assume, Corey, you file you file suit with that. You're you're good with the frontal shot. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it did, just to clarify too, I did just put a video up this morning of the frontal shot that Shannon's talking about from a bullet he killed a couple years ago, and you know, okay, four so yards. It's hard to morning. beat that. Yeah. Um, so and so we'll we'll promote that on Facebook and Instagram here after the show. But uh, uh, I couple years um, essentially what you really want to look for is you want to make sure that you have an arrow setup one that's heavy enough to to do an impact um, on a perfect frontal shot just in case you're not perfect that you do have the opportunity to blow through brisket or something like that so the heavier arrow setups that people are starting to go to now are definitely going to improve the um, the killability of that shot but yeah I wouldn't hesitate to take it as well and same thing you know most of our shots are under 20 yards anyway so like Shannon was saying if we get an opportunity under 20 we're going to take it because it's it's pretty deadly yeah, it's not really a frontal, it's quartering too. So I think there's a misconception there. Right. Directly facing me, I would tend to shy away from that. If he's slightly quartering to me, then I'll then I'll take it. Okay. Well, what about you, Matt? Well, I would agree to a certain extent that that, that quartering two shot is super deadly. Uh, I think the kill zone is pretty small for your average guy. It's a tough shot to recommend just to your average elk hunter, uh, but it's a super deadly shot. But that true frontal shot, um, I'm adamant. Lost him. Yeah, I lost you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I think you said you're adamant about not taking it. Um, did you lose? You, did you have me now, John? Yeah, I got you now. Do you have me now, John? I do. Okay, yeah. So I, that true frontal shot, I'm adamantly against. I've just spent too much time tracking bulls and stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, that quartering two shot can work if you know your anatomy, you know where to place the arrow. Uh, it can be super deadly, super efficient. Um, but those true dead-on frontal shots uh, of your average guy, um, you know, with, with just your average archery setup, uh, it's a pretty risky shot, in my opinion. It's a super risky shot. Yeah. What about you, Mario? <laughs> um, I've taken that shot for years, but I've also was preached from my father at early age, you know, heavy 600 grain setups and weight forward and big Zwickies and now I shoot two blades like Kudus or maybe a Magnus uh, glue on, but I, I like two blades. I can put them anywhere. They'll go through bone. Um, so I like that shot, but guiding, I've had a lot of guys lose bowls. Let's say a guy has 25, 26, 27 inch draw length, got sh yeah. short arrows and his bow shop's going for speed, which a lot of bow shops do. Um, it's not, not as bad up in the Northwest, I feel, but down South it is. And a lot of places are all about speed. And it, they just won't get arrow penetration. Um, will that bull die? He'll die, but maybe he won't bleed because he didn't have two holes in him. Right. Um, so it's, uh, you know, know your equipment, like uh, Corey said and um, Matt said. It's all about setups, you know. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're heavy enough. And it's not about just as much kinetic energy. Um, front of center uh, needs to be high as well. So yeah. build an elk setup, fellas. Build an elk setup makes perfect sense i uh personally my setup is very medium i don't uh go for speed and i don't go for heavy and i'm kind of because i hunt everything and i hunt everywhere um and it just comes down to you know the situation uh, i've taken plenty of frontal shots before um can't say that i have on elk um I've, I've done it on deer and, and antelope many, many times um, and had no problems at all, but elk is a different story. I would definitely uh, wait for a better shot myself just because my setup isn't really designed for pounding through. I know like Corey shoots like what, 300 grains up front or something like that, which is like some how much some people's uh, – a whole hour setup, setup. Is, is, you know, so yeah, completely Send different it. story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, all there right, we're go. gonna move on because we can sit here. This becomes like a uh, yeah. You know, How's that, John? Exactly. That one right there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. So <laughs> again, I got another question about late archery bull, and I think Matt said it best. Uh, you just got to, if you're going to hunt the late season, you got to pick those units that are very glassable and treat it like, uh, like your deer hunt, you know, just treat it like a spot and stock deer hunt. Um, depending on the weather too, you can, you can apply sitting on water or moving back to a mineral lick or something if that's legal in your state. 
Um, but uh, really for me, I, it's, I, it becomes a spot stock. And really it depends what, what you're considering a late season tag. So like I've now, now here in Arizona, they've moved, they've pushed it back even further. But when it used to be that early November, um, you know, or mid November tag rather, it, it wasn't, it wasn't completely, the rut wasn't completely over. There were still bulls with cows. Uh, there was still some bugling going on. Not that you really could call them in, but you can use locating bugles. You can listen for bugles and find them. So like it really just all depends on uh, where you're hunting. But I know a lot of these questions came from Arizona guys uh, on the late season tag since uh, it, it t- tends to be a a popular tag to go for nowadays. Um, okay, so my next question I got here was, uh, let's say I'm going blind into an area never been elk hunting in that unit before what are three major things uh i would have to prioritize other than water holes so what basically what are you looking for i'm going to give each of you guys it's just give me one thing so i'm going to start with uh, matt go ahead give me matt matt what you, what you think your first uh first and foremost thing to look for oh we lose you again matt and essentially looking for blank spots on the maps, looking for those and Matt, areas start where I can get as far as, as possible. Matty, you got to start over, buddy. You cut out your whole first uh, part of your answer. Sorry, there. sorry, buddy. Um, in the southwest, the main thing I'm looking for is to get away from the road. So I'm looking at maps, and I'm looking for holes in the maps, looking for blank spots, and uh, trying to figure out where I can get into those core areas as far away from the roads as possible. Uh, even if that's a relatively small area here in, in some of these central and northern Arizona units, uh, but those even if you're just a half mile or a mile in from some of our forest service roads, in some cases, it makes all the world a difference. So I'm looking for holes on the maps, looking for blank spots away from the roads that allow us to get away from them. Cool. Shannon? I'm looking for a variety of different terrain fe- features. I want, uh, of course, the water. I want uh, food sources. And I want big ridge lines that I can I can locate from. So and. and to me, I cover tons of ground to find one elk. So I would look for for that big long ridge line to be able to cover all the little fingers off of it. And that's let me clarify on that. Yeah, are you glassing from those? Or are you using that to to send your location bugles from? If, from for locating, um, I typically steer away from areas I can glass. I'm I'm looking for the elk that haven't been hunted and pressured by a lot of people. So. I want to find that big, vast timber canyon or something. Okay. Mario? Um, you know, I, I guess if, you know, if you're a non-resident and you're, you're trying to go to a, di- a different state, I'd start out, if you draw if you draw a tag, then start out with the unit. Buy yourself a rugged unit map. Um, make a phone call to a, a state biologist and pick his brain. Um, doesn't mean that he'll have the best answers but it's a place to start to learn Mm -hmm. uh and then just like shannon was saying you know uh look and matt you know get off of a a map and find those water sources and and, uh, north side slopes for bedding and um but i I always start out with a map google earth is huge um (laughs) learn a bunch on google earth oh yeah for sure um and Corey, what do you got to add to that uh, well, I, I would assume that everybody's already figured their way into the area that they're at if they're going in blind. So once you get there, you're looking for sign. Uh, we look for rubs. Rubs are an, an absolute indicator that there are bulls in the area. So once your boots on the ground, then you got to start looking for what is around. And that's one of the easiest things you can tell is um, by the rubs. You know, you're not necessarily just for tracks or anything like that, but active rubs of what's going on in that, that point in time. Right. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to actually add a little bit to this because I'm kind of uh, uniquely uh, qualified to answer this question since everything I do is almost out of state and in a new area. Um, One of the tricks I learned is I look for big tracts of private land that have small tracts of public land adjacent to them that are not easy to access. And that's usually where I find uh, the one, <laughs> so to speak. So, um, 
and, and you know you can use like onyx or google or well google earth that won't give you necessarily uh property so onyx is really good for that but uh I'm not, we just got some crazy feedback from something. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's kind of my. I'm still tip. working, John. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, I got. Let me just see if I can make heads or tails of this question. What constitutes altitude changes for elk? Uh, where to hunt and what time of year? Um, I don't know. Whoever wants to jump in on that one, uh, that's kind of like very area specific. Uh, but it'd be good to get probably here from everybody from where they hunt. Uh, you want to go? Snow first? will definitely constitute altitude change. Yeah, for sure. They're always the uh, falling snow line. Um, weather, I guess weather is the, the biggest uh, of, of all, I think. Um, I have some other ideas and some other opinions about it. Matt, are you uh, still with us? Because uh, I thought it looked like yeah, you froze here, up. Okay, what's uh, what's your opinion on that? Um, our elk in the southwest actually don't move a bunch. We don't drop a bunch of elevation. They're not migrating herds right. like they are up in the up, up in the uh, what, you know north. Yeah, we lost you, Maddie. Or he must be in Mexico. He's... Yeah, he's he's outside uh, his house because <laughs> he's remodeling the house and he doesn't want to go inside <laughs> with all the noise. Okay. <laughs> So um, for, I, I think it's totally situational and where you're at, even from, you know, uh, the Oregon coast to uh, eastern Oregon. And, uh, you know, if you're hunting a big mountain range that goes up to 10,000 feet, then you have alpine. And you'll find that in those areas uh, when you're trying to find bulls in the summertime that there's more up up in the goat country uh, in the rocks um, hanging out by themselves than down in the timber. Um but it, that's only because you have, you know, 10,000 feet to work with. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's it, wherever your hunting's different. I find like, okay, well, I'm going to make this just specific to Arizona because this is typically our, like Matt was saying, our elk don't really migrate very much because they don't have to. Our winters aren't severe enough. The only place I ever really see a bunch of that drastic movement is actually hunting San Francisco peaks. Obviously it's the tallest mountain we have. Um, a lot of those bulls, they summer really, really way up high, you know, 11,000 feet or whatever, 12,000 feet. But all the elk or all the cow elk are down at, you know, seven, 8,000 feet. I, I tend to see that those bulls will come down when the rut kicks in and then they'll wor work their way back up to, uh, you know, snow line, whatever that is, uh, you know, throughout the, the later part of the season. So... And you guys only, you guys have two weeks to hunt in the middle of September, whereas like, you know, maybe in Oregon or Colorado when it opens up, you know, August 26th, then a lot of times it's year to year from moons, but, you mm -hmm. know, like last year they were all white antlered in lots of places that are high in the mountains, like by themselves, they're still feeding. Oh, wow. um, we're all on the coast. They were probably already going nuts. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I think it's too, I mean, the coast is more temperate. And and I'll probably has something. The weather has something to do with it, even though biologists well, will argue argue otherwise. Because really, the rut has nothing to do with weather. Whoa! Not like a Mack truck came through. Got to do. You guys got to do this with the headphones on. Every time something like that <laughs> no happens, kidding. it rings my bell. <laughs> oh. Yeah, as far as altitude on the Oregon coast, an elk can go from the bottom of the mountain to the top in just a couple hours so we yeah. don't really have to deal with that um brandon scott go and sent you a, a personal question matt um if you if you want to answer that via text so i could get to these other questions and uh sure cool i got um Actually, this is one I want to talk to you about too, because I know what you guys you guys kind of like to use them or not. Um, but I'll throw it out there. What's your opinions on uh, and and or tactics using decoys? Mario, want to start off? Um, I haven't had great luck with decoys, but um, I think a lot of it is I haven't uh, had as much faith in them and tried them. Uh, mm -hmm. Like when I used decoys in Kansas for deer. It was because, you know, I'm like, oh, I was scared to use them. And then when I started using them a bunch, I learned what I could get away with. And 
those bucks are coming in. But elk, I haven't had great success with. Maybe if I have a client, I have like a, uh, a Montana elk decoy or something. I'll hang it from a tree to hope that there's just a little color in there. He might get curious. Right. Um, but to me, they just kind of get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. I got. I have a kind of a similar feel about them. I've used them. Um, my cousin Anthony, I called his bull over this hill and I had him sitting off the side and he was really didn't have much cover. So that's why I used a decoy to kind of get the elk to look in my direction and uh, from where I was calling from. And it worked out good, you know, worked in that situation. It gave us a, a couple extra seconds. I don't think he was coming no matter what, but I think what it did, did for him is was able to let him draw back uh, because he couldn't see the elk coming. And, it, and, and when he saw it coming, that's when he was able to draw or that's when he knew when to draw. Um, so um, I think in no, situations like that, it works. Like, I've never used them in super thick environments like the coast. Maybe you guys tried them, Shannon? Like, I mean. Uh, I haven't, I haven't tried them yet. Um, there's a couple situations I thought they may have came into as an advantage, but just hasn't been something consistently enough to where I even bring one with me. Right. Yeah. I think the bugles are a good enough decoy for us down there. Well, they can't see freaking five feet in the damn brush over there anyway, so it doesn't matter. They're coming to look for the decoy. It's, you guys have got them killed already. But, uh, what about you, Matt? Are you uh, are you still with me over here? Nope. I don't see Matt. Yeah, he keeps disappearing and coming back. Damn central Arizona internet. There uh, he is. <laughs> I got you back. Okay. We just asked about uh, decoys, and I know you like to use them. So what's your opinion, and how do you yeah, use I'm them? Yeah, I'm actually a huge fan of decoys. Um, I've had really good luck with them. Uh, we tend to hunt a little bit more open terrain sometimes, and it's been the difference in maybe having a few seconds or, or maybe having a, a bull snap his head at attention and look at you, think you're a cow, and, and, and relax and continue on his way. Um, so I've had really good luck with them. I, I tend to carry the Montana uh, rump. That, that cow elk rump um, and, uh, and or maybe a heads up decoy also, uh, something super light and mobile. Um, and uh, it's, it's bought us a few seconds on a few different occasions and they're worth it to me to carry for sure. Cool, yeah, they're not too much to, to carry around for sure. Um, so the next question I got um, is elk in the rut, when do you think is the best time to challenge a bull versus cow call? And if he already has a two two part question, and if he already has a herd of cows, how uh, how close do you get before you challenge him? You want to go for it, Shannon, on that one? Sure, I know sure. Kind sure. of, you've talked about that before. And, well, I don't think I don't it's think ever that. too early. I think your reaction may vary as the season progresses, but uh, you know these elk are very territorial here on the coast. So if, if I can get a reaction out of him, and I, part of my calling technique is to just go straight at him, and, and that's calling him the entire time. So as soon as I get close enough, then he's going to tell me what's too close, and he's going to come into me. So, yeah, I get aggressive from the first day of hunting season to the last. Cool. Mario? Um. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I guess it's always situational, but every bull is, I mean, I, I love to bugle. I'm always the guy that's getting yelled at, um, you know, you bugle too much, you bugle too much, but um, <laughs> uh, eventually you're going to find out what note he likes and, and you'll learn when he's fired up and, you know, maybe when you, once you get in, like Shannon said, to that close range, maybe even then just raking will be something that he just snaps on um, or, but, but when you're moving in like Shannon does, you'll learn as you progress what he's liking. So, um, it, it's, it's, a I love it. Yeah. I like that. Cool. Corey. Yeah. Um, from a time standpoint, I think, you know, the, uh, late morning, early part, early middle part of the day, uh, you're going to get a different reaction than if you're, if you find them on their feet. Uh, we've kind of learned that rather than them you know bugle locate and then having them walking away bugling because they're moving to their their bedding ground a little detrimental to your actual uh the kill so uh, right. time of the day has a lot to do with how that elk's going to react as well if you if he responds from his bed 
then you get aggressive and push in on him like those guys were saying it's going to completely change how he reacts to you right and maddie totally agree with the guys it's just it's going to depend on the bull and the situation and, and what the situation that you're in at that particular time and it's going to be different on every day on every bull for the most part uh as to how much you're going to pressure and how close you're going to push yourself in in some cases you're going to rush in as, co as close as the terrain allows you uh mm -hmm. in certain cases in the last year or so mario and i've called in from pushing a mile away across the country so um mm -hmm. it just totally depends on the situation. well let me ask you this because I know, I know exactly where my head went when you guys were answering this question. Um, so I'm sure the listeners did the same thing. How do I recognize, you know, what are some of the things I could recognize from how the bull is responding to me that make me say, okay, I'm doing the right thing or, okay, I need to challenge him harder or I need to get in there closer Whoever wants to jump in there first is fine with me. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, the emotion in that bull's bugle, um, it's not really how long it takes for him to answer me. It's how serious is he about it. And I can tell if he's a dominant bull, if he's a satellite bull, by just his his energy he puts into his, his bugle. And as I'm getting closer, usually I can feel that intensity increasing. And I know he's... He's, he's going to come in eventually when I get close enough to, to be the threat. And like Corey touched on, if this has happened in the middle of the day, his cows are bedded down, and that bull's not going to tolerate me getting too close to his, his cows. Right. Makes perfect sense. Um, I think that's a good, good sum up of that question. I don't know if we have to beat on that anymore, but... Um, so, oh, John, one other thing I'll throw okay. in there too is if, if uh, like these, like Mario was saying, he said several times, like if that bull gets up and he starts raking trees, it's another good indication that there's there's a little there's a change in his attitude at that point in time. Right. You know, if the bull just sits down at the bottom of a canyon and, and bugles, you know, high squeal, he's he's just letting you know he's down there. He he doesn't really want to do anything, but um, you know, so like Mario said. The, the raking is uh, is a, obviously a true sign of of the attitude of that bull. Cool. And if you're uh, if you're if you're hunting like the high country and it's in your glassing and you see a bull that maybe has six you know ten cows I don't know and he has them in this timber right. patch on a slope and and maybe there's a a satellite bull that keeps coming to within fifty yards of it and then outrages this bull. Right. You know, it's all situational. Heck, you, you walk up into that situation and you go and it's all over. Because oh, yeah. he's been, you know, um, so always just look for good situations and take advantage of them. You know, I'm glad you said that. That's a great, I wish I, I'm glad I didn't cut you off completely. Um, <laughs> that's a good answer. You know, um, yeah, it's just uh, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and keeping your eyes and ears open and just alert. It's, it all comes down to, and I preach this all the time, it's always kind of learning, doing your best to learn the behavior of the animal that you're hunting. That way you can apply um, knowledge instead of and, and react properly when when the elk are giving you you know information because that's what they're doing. They they poop over here, they're leaving you information. They bugle over there, they're leaving you information, and it's all how you process and put it together and come up with a plan to uh, execute. So, um, so. Oh, we got a question. I think this is a good question. I'm going to throw this to Matt just because uh, Matt's an outfitter and uh, he, I'm sure he gets asked this question all the time. It's my first elk hunt, uh, September 15th to the 28th. Uh, sounds like I got an Arizona guy here. What are, the, what are some of the necessities gear wise that, uh, that I should not forget and what can I overlook? Uh, good question. Um... Well, there's all the little things that you're going to have in the field with you um, that, that you're going to find that are important and that you go through them like wind checker. Um, you know, we use a lot of the little puff bottle wind checkers uh, and a lot of, you know, read calls. We end up carrying extras on us because we blow through them and burn through them over the course of, say, a two week elk season. So you never want to run out of that, have to burn a day going back to town for the little stuff. 
Um, that's a really good question. I had, had one, one of the, the little things that are so critical. Um, I think a lot of guys carry too much gear uh, in Arizona. Uh, I know situations differ when you get up a little bit further north of us. Uh, but in Arizona in particular, elk hunting is done in pretty mild country um, for the most part and uh, mm -hmm. on national forest ground uh, for the most part. And uh, I see a lot of guys struggling with huge 35 pound packs uh, for, for morning hunts when they're going to end up, uh, uh, when, you know, covering two miles for the day and stuff. So I see a lot of guys bringing a lot of extra gear, uh, which is unnecessary and slows them down. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I think you got to really watch what you take and just take your basic first aid and your water and your snacks. And we, we run pretty light when we're hunting elk in Arizona. Um, mm -hmm. We're running with small, tight little packs, uh, moving fast, covering a lot of ground. And um, you know, that's one thing I do hate to see is those, those huge, huge packs with all the gear in them loaded down for a for a our morning hunt. Right. Um, Shannon, you got anything or Corey, you got anything to add to that? Don't forget your bow. Yeah, <laughs> extra extra release in the pack. <laughs> release, um, <laughs> and uh, broadheads on your arrows because yeah. we've had it happen. People have on yeah on guided hunts. You have went out in the field and they've had field tips. Oh, yeah, nice. yeah, for sure. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna add a couple of things just because I felt like we left that a little open. I'm gonna I um I say dress in layers. Being able to be able to take stuff off and put stuff on as you need it. Um, I'm a carry enough but not too much kind of guy. I like to have, uh, no matter, even if I'm hunting in Arizona and I know I'm only going to be five miles from my truck, I like to carry my like in reach or at least a GPS with me just because, you know, sometimes, um, you know, let's say you shot an elk and you're tracking them all over God's great earth over there and you just stole over the place and you made a bad shot or something and you know you find yourself in the middle of nowhere and 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 you get turned around you know pretty easily um i always carry some survival stuff with me always carry like you know way to start a fire um you know just i carry real lightweight stuff i always carry a you know a survival blanket with me which really folds up to like nothing you know just a little pouch Again, like I say, I try to stay light. My pack's never really over 20 pounds max, uh, if not, not even less than that. Um, I always carry two knives, especially when I'm with elk. You know, it's very easy to blow through a knife real quick, you know, especially if you don't know how to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, really, there's no – you don't need to carry a bunch of little specialty things in my opinion like i there's certain certain necessities that are going to keep you safe uh you know headlamp and a backup flashlight um but otherwise i mean i don't think there's really much else you you know you just kind of dress in layers have a nice packable ring top or something and cuz the weather changes fast but um yeah, that's about it. That's all I got on that. Just tell them to make sure that make sure that their outfitter carries everything, right, Matt? Yep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Six pack of Rainier, Swiss Army knife. That's what they're getting. Yeah. That's what they're there for. Well, Matt Matt hunts in shorts and a t shirt and he carries a water bottle in his pocket, so Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have one and a water bottle. That's it. <laughs> um so i get this i got this uh question thrown at me again this is kind of real situational but what's your preferred tactic to calling bulls and of course it always depends on time of the year and and so on and so forth and we kind of hit this a little bit with uh um you know some of the other questions we got but they also clarified it too by asking if you preferred a mouth read or a handheld um I just, let's just, everybody tell me what your favorite is. We'll start with Shannon and Corey and then go Matt and Mario. And I use a read, mouth read for everything. Um, it's just the ability to, to use it, make it, make what sound when you want to make it, no matter what you're doing with your hands. If I'm in full draw and I need to stop and with a bark, whew, 
I can stop him, you know. You just can't do that with a hoochie mama or any other kind of external call. Right. Guy, Corey. Yeah, I think uh, specifically for archery, being hands-free is uh, of the utmost importance. So we, we use reeds. Um, we pretty much have one reed in particular that we're able to make, you know, most every call that you could possibly imagine with it. Um, and then, you know, if you're hunting something else and you have the ability to use a hand, you might, I mean, there are some really nice small handheld cow calls that you might be able to utilize to stop something. But for the most part, I mean, there, nothing replaces a mouth read. Yeah, I agree. Well, go ahead, uh, Matt. Totally agree. And for the same reasons, uh, they're hands free. Um, into my sleeves and in my pockets. And you're coming what he's trying in. to say is that he likes to wear a romper. And a hoochie mama. He likes to wear a. He likes to wear an elk-colored romper and put a elk hat on and run around the field, skipping. <laughs> <laughs> Mario, what do you like to use? Um, I love mouth calls. Um, you know, I just recommend whatever you, your mouth likes to blow. Or you know, so some guys like Carlton, some guys like Bugle and Bull, some guys like Phelps. Um, I like Bugle and Bull just because I kind of grew up on them. Um, mm -hmm. I like a blue remedy a lot. It can make a lot of sounds with that or a mellow or like a yellow mama. Those yellow ones nice. Um also like I do like to use um you know, like a, a Carlton fighting cow call that's kind of okay. loud maybe to locate in canyons and when it's windy and stuff. Um but other than that I I just like to use a mouth call. Yeah. Um I like to use Fox Pro. <laughs> Where, where, it's where, legal. Our <laughs> where it's legal <laughs> where it's legal i like to use it because it's uh perfect but no i i prefer a, a a read myself i i like these um single read just because they're easy uh i use those primos with the little uh hyper dome again because it's easy and i'm not a very good elk caller uh but it's also versatile uh i can turkey call on it i can coyote call on it i can predator call on it so it's kind of a call that I keep in my pack all the time, even if I'm deer hunting, because I might switch to something else or whatever. But um, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty versatile, and like you said, it's hands free and easy to you know easy to master, or I want to say master, easy to use. Mastering might be a different uh, story. <laughs> so, um, so my last question I had from all the pre questions, and honestly, I. It, it's been so hard for me to keep up with the people that are asking questions over here. So any, anybody that's asking questions on Facebook right now that we haven't got to, we will type those questions back into you uh, after this is over. Um, so the last question I got yesterday that I wrote down was uh, how early should you start scouting for early muzzleloader bull hunt and how much do the bulls pattern change during, during the rut? Okay. So when you start scouting and, you know, what do the bulls do differently once the rut changes? Um, Matt, you want to take that one? If sure. we can hear you, well, if we can pattern. hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Their, their patterns change dramatically as the rut kicks in. So uh, muzzleloader season in Arizona starts the morning after the uh, early rifles, or excuse me, early archery season. So you got two weeks of bow hunters, and then you kick in the next day. And so your bulls, big bulls, haven't aren't even with the cows and haven't even moved in until essentially during the archery season in Arizona. And so your critical time on those big bulls is just a week or two prior to your hunt. Uh, your pre-scouting is essentially just locating cows, locating areas of good feed that are going to have a lot of cows in them because the bulls are going to be there. Uh, the bulls will not be there in July and August, though, uh, until the rut kind of kicks into gear. So um, things are going to change dramatically as the rut progresses. Big bulls start moving in with the cows, um, and that's going to be a you know, peak rut type situation, which is right about when that hunt kicks into gear. So um, right. you're going to be scouting essentially during the bow hunt. Right. Um, I'm going to add to that. My take on hunting anything in the rut, and that goes for deer, elk, antelope, no matter what, I'm just scouting for the ladies. I'm finding where the ladies are, and that's where I'm going to focus my attention 
overcome the rut. Uh, it's a pretty s- simple way of thinking of things. And it, um, you know, cause I've, I've done the other, you know, I've, I had an elk hunt, I want to say it was early 2000. Uh, and I had all these pictures of beautiful giant bulls and velvet on my camera and, you know, and just a lot of, uh, you know, boots on the ground, watching them from a distance and whatnot. And then came elk season. And I didn't see any, any of those bulls. Uh, so, but uh, what's your, what's your take on that, uh, Corey or, or Shannon? Uh, I'll take it. I don't see Shannon's done a whole lot of muzzleloading hunting in his day. I used to muzzleload hunt in Washington. Um, I still archery hunt during the muzzleloader season in Washington. And really kind of what you guys have said, we put out trail cameras over the summer uh, really just looking for for cows uh, we want to know where those cows are at you know if we get a, a nice bull on camera that's great uh, but really looking for for where the cows are at and then some of your best scouting is during archery season you get out and you bugle and you locate and you find those bulls that are still alive during archery season and they're going to still be alive right at the end our our, our muzzleloader season starts the week the first week of october um, so there's not a lot of separation like you guys were saying earlier between archery and, and muzzleloader season so scout during archery season when when you can locate um and then as soon as that muzzleloader season starts the tactics shouldn't really necessarily change right uh, it's just just your weapon it's choice right. if that's just what you choose to man. do correct man uh, i i typically start scouting the day after my season ends um it's closest to when you're actually going to be out there if if you're hunting local to where you live it's fairly easy to do right you know and, and here with the roosevelt is you know they don't travel you know, to go, they don't migrate anywhere. They don't, they don't really go anywhere. Um, what I found with these bigger bulls is they will actually go get cows mm-hmm. and bring them back to where they usually stay. Okay. So, so um, during the springtime and like right now in the early summer, they're, they're off getting the most nutritional vegetation they can find. And this is the only time I think scouting can be kind of misleading. Mm-hmm. is when you're finding bulls growing, having the antler growth, trying to put fat reserves on. If I find them in October, November, December, these Roosevelt's are generally going to be in that same general area. So. Okay. Mario, what's your thoughts on it? Um, I'd say it's, it depends on where you're hunting, public land, private land. If you're on an 80,000 acre ranch in New Mexico that hasn't been called to you the whole year, um, you can be pretty aggressive with them. But let's say you're hunting, you know, uh, Washington muzzleloader. Like I, you know, sometimes those elk have been called out so much. I feel like they're still going to bugle, but they more off to take their cows and leave. Mm-hmm. So I would recommend uh, having a buddy sit back while you move in so they don't feel as pressure. He'll still bugle, but let your buddy move in and, and make it easier for him. Right. Cool. All right, guys. Well, that's all the uh, questions I had. I saw quite a few come across. Uh, there was one in particular that I meant to write down and I missed it. It was a really good question, uh, and I can't see it anymore because Facebook Live only lets me see the first like five or six questions or the last five or six questions. Um, so I'll uh, try to get that answered for uh, whomever it was. I don't remember. Um, but uh that's it, really. Has anybody got any uh, words of wisdom or uh, final uh, thoughts they want to pass along? There was a good question here that I thought that Shannon could answer. Um, where did it go? Hmm. Yeah, it's, I hate there, Facebook Live uh, for that reason. So uh, when, when you're when you're bugling to a bull, how do you know uh, to bugle soft? or super aggressive as you're moving in in on him. Oh yeah, that's the question I was, I was looking at. So for myself, I'm targeting that big mature herd bull. So I don't think I can get too aggressive. And I'm trying to increase his intensity and get him fired up. So I'm as loud and as mean as I can possibly be. Uh-oh. So, are, Just so like do, you, do you start Look out? Up. Uh, you know, do you just let out a high pitched squeal or do you, or you start out aggressive from the start or, well, you know, as far okay, as when you I'll locate, yeah. I'm listening. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> to locate, I'll generally do that high pitch, long drug out tone. 
And I'll follow that up with just an aggressive bugle and chuckle. And what I've, what I've found over the years is if I can get their attention with that locate bugle, I can get a reaction with that aggressive uh, chuckle and whatnot at the end. Cool. So we got, one, we got a little visit from here, my uh, son. What's that? Let me throw something in that I've, sure. I've observed with the way that Shannon calls too, is that as we start getting close to that bull, you, a lot of you guys have probably heard this is that you start getting into on that bull. He, many times they'll try to throw you off by, by uh, quiet calling uh, to make it feel as if you're, they're further away than you are. And I've seen that <laughs> tactic in, in verse mm -hmm. rework or work with Shannon, um, either deflecting his, his calling to a different direction and pulling that bull in um beyond like into an area where he wants it to go rather than calling it directly to him but i've also seen right. him kind of quiet up his calls a little bit and throw that bull off so utilizing their tactics to your advantage can also be a, a real positive thing and it's pretty impressive when you get to stand there and watch it work uh because it, it's definitely a skill right. yeah when i when i get in close i use a lot of little sounds i wouldn't even call them bugles they're just little elk sounds you know little moans and squeaks and grunts and and chuckles and whatnot and and i've seen it happen uh dozens of times where you know a bull you're you're in within 100 yards and he'll turn his head and face completely away and just lightly bugle and then he'll snap his head around waiting for you to approach him because you know they're they're on the defense they want to know right. who's coming in for the fight their biggest threat in the woods is another bull so that's mm -hmm. that's what they're concerned with the most so right right Anybody uh, else want to add to that, Maddie? No, I agree with that. Absolutely. Mario? No, that's it. Yeah, I, I, anyone that's listening to this right now, take all that info to heart because you will be a better hunter because of it. It'll make you dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I noticed that um, when I hunted in Colorado, that the bulls really tended to grab their cows and run away from you if you were bugling at all. Um, and unfortunately, it's been a few years since I've been there. Uh, and I'd like to, when I go back, I'd like to try uh, Joel Turner's uh, bull cull and cows bugle and see if that works. But I end up hunting them like, um, like deer because – no matter what, every time I tried to call at them, uh, they ran away. The only bull that I called in was all cow calling, uh, and it was real soft, you know, very – I wasn't getting really whiny or very, like, aggressive cow calling where I was, you know, trying to be estrus. But uh, – and I called in a five-by-five five that was – it was a little too dark still. Like I, I, I did an, uh, an Arizona tactic that I, well, that I learned out here, I should say, I don't know if it's an Arizona tactic or not, but I, I chased them in the dark in the bugles. Cause that's all they were only bugling at, at, you know, before light. And I just kept getting closer and closer in the dark. And then I sat down and, you know, I just kept calling little muse here and there once in a while. And, uh, he kept coming in closer and closer. And I was kind of trying to, judge it with the with the light coming up you know and it was light enough for me to see him it just wasn't like well i i was actually light enough for me to shoot him but i didn't but the camera couldn't see him so that's why i didn't shoot him but uh anyway i uh i'm wondering again since i'm not an excellent uh elk hunter if or elk caller I should say um if i was to take you know Shannon or something like that at Colorado or one of you guys that calls a lot better than me. I'd like to see what the difference would be uh, if it was just my style of calling or, or if it's just, you know, um, because of where we're at and because of how, how many people hunt Colorado because it's over the counter and it's the most popular over the counter state, I think uh, just because they're numbers. Well, uh, it might've been how far they were traveling from their, uh, feeding to their bedding grounds if they're traveling six miles in Colorado. Or, I mean, even if you're hunting alfalfa elk that are coming down a long ways, no, it might, is... it might go eight miles. You know, like, oh um, man, you'll you'll have hard be hard pressed to be go bowling when he's going back to his bedding right. grounds. I'm pretty sure that Corey or Shannon said that earlier. Yeah, but Corey uh, how... touched on it earlier. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, the time I'll of the day it, has I... a lot to do with it. 
Yeah. Yeah. There was no agriculture. agriculture. There's no agriculture around where I was hunting. Um, This is like backcountry, you know, pitch tent uh, elk hunting. How far were they moving? You know, I don't really think they weren't really moving that far as far as miles are concerned. They gained elevation and dropped elevation. I would say they were probably gaining about 1,500 feet, which is quite a ways. Um, You know, and then, and then. My little guy's like, uh, he wants to get onto this podcast. Good. <laughs> but um, anyway, so like, I, I've always thought back to that hunt and I, I could, could never figure out what I was, what I was doing wrong. I had a couple of opportunities to shoot a couple of cows. Um, I had that one bull, like I said, I could have shot him, but um, really it was just, it was, um, it was tough hunting all the way around. And it really didn't lend itself, the area didn't lend itself to glass. And I was always trying to think to myself, what can I do differently to, you know, because the guys that, that were hunting and that I was hunting with that um, that hunt there all the time, they basically still hunt in them. You know, they just snuck through the woods, came, came up on the herd and, you know, slipped in to make a shot. And, you know, that's great, but you got to be, there's a lot of luck involved with that because you got to come across the herd, you know. Um, so it's a different kind know. of skill. Yeah. I, I'm not a sneaky guy at all. I'm and those not. elk are going, you know, they're walking as fast as we can walk on an escalator, you know, like, right. on a, so if they're going up 1500 feet, maybe, and then going on a North slope and bedding down. Mm-hmm. And if they're doing that to you every single day and maybe it's hot out, so they're shutting up early or the moons are weird. So they're just kind of quiet. Um, sometimes maybe you try to get up on top of that ridge where they going up over a ridge or, uh, um, I, I, I found them a couple of times going on to a benches and stuff like that. And I, and I would get on them there, but the, it was so thick that I really couldn't sneak up on them and shoot them while they were in their bed. So I would try to get in close and call and they wouldn't have nothing to do with me. So it wasn't just when they were trying to go away from me. And I was like, it was really getting on me. Cause I was like, what the freak am I doing wrong? You know, I can't figure it out. Um, you know. And the one morning that I did have where they were lighting up everywhere and this, let's just see, there must've been a couple of cows got hot in the area or something. Um, and the bulls were just going back and forth a lot. Even that I felt like I was chasing them, you know, but I don't know. It's just one of those situations. I, I always well, keep saying to there. myself, I'd like to go back and go with somebody who's <laughs> a better elk hunter than me and a better elk um, caller than I am and see what, you know, how the situation would play out and what they would do. Cause it's a situation. Usually I, I'm able to learn from my, you know, from my mishaps and my mistakes or how it take something away from it. But from that specific trick, uh, trip, it always sticks out in my mind that I never was able to take anything away from it. It was like, you know, I was left with more questions than answers. So, but, um, uh, yeah, one of these days, uh, I'm going to scoop one of you guys up and we're going to go to Colorado and go shoot an elk, but so anyway all right guys well i think we kind of hit them all uh we got all these questions that i had and we got to most of the guys online here um yeah kenneth powers just said sneaky asshole definitely not a sneaky asshole um (laughs) that that was the irony of that whole uh hashtag sneaky asshole was uh that i'm not sneaky at all um i'm like a woolly mammoth coming through the woods but uh, anyhow, yeah, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for taking time out of your day and uh, helping these guys out and uh, answering these questions and spending some time with me. I appreciate it a lot. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'll talk to all you guys uh, here in the near future. All right, John. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, Thank guys. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. Nice right. meeting you guys. All right, take care. Nice meeting you. Good luck Good this luck. year, guys. Yeah. Thanks you as well. Thanks, right. Mario.